Welcome to Ticking Stock with Kelly McMillan. If the name sounds like a business show to you, then you've got it all wrong. Kelly McMillan is the principal of McMillan Fiberglass Stocks and will talk about shooting for fun, competition, hunting, and self-defense. Now, here is your host, Kelly McMillan. Hi, everyone. And welcome to Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan. Uh, thanks for being with us. This is kind of a momentous day for all of us here. We're really excited. We're actually going to be broadcasting this show live on Facebook. So uh, as you look at the screen right now, you probably see a box that says Zev Nadler on it. Yes, he is hiding behind that. Uh, who would know when you buy a computer that you'd have to be aware of whether or not the camera is at the top of the monitor at the bottom? <laughs> As you can see, <laughs> Zev's camera is at the bottom of the monitor and it shows right up his nostrils. <laughs> so we're going to actually figure that out later. But for now, we're just going to blank him out because uh, you also see Cooper. Cooper is with us, but she's got a cold and uh, she doesn't want to be coughing the whole time she's on the screen. So she'll just uh, open the screen when she's ready to share uh, her stuff with social media. And then we've got uh, Voice America, which is broadcasting this and also sharing it to some of their uh, Facebook pages. So we're really excited to have you all listening live. A lot going on in the world right now. A, a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, if you can see, uh, I'm wearing an old shirt of mine, Macmillan Merchant Solutions. I don't know if you remember back in 2012, Bank of America told me to find another bank because I was in the firearms business. I actually manufactured a bolt action rifle uh, under the name McMillan firearms back then. That was before I sold the company. And uh, just because I was in the firearms business, they, they asked me to, to take a hike. And that was part of operation choke point. It was long before they ever announced it, but that was the process in which the administration had set up um, this coercion with the banks to convince them not to do business with the people that they chose not to do business with. Uh, and it included firearms, ammunition, uh, payday loans. I had some stuff in there that really made sense, like escort services and stuff like that. But it had a lot of legal law abiding businesses that were doing everything by the book. Uh, and they claimed that it was a high risk. Well, you know, there's there's no less risky business than b selling a firearm when you have the the person who's purchasing it sign a federal document saying that they've received it. Because when you talk about fraud in the credit card business, it's people buying stuff with with stolen credit cards or buying stuff, taking it, you know, on uh, what they're doing now. I understand a lot of the drug addicts are, are using gift cards, buying stuff on gift cards, then taking it back and getting the cash. Uh, all kinds of stuff goes on. And, and there is a lot of fraud in the retail end of stuff, but in the firearms industry, that's really not happening. But that, that's what they used as an excuse. Well, I've heard from three different customers of mine and, and friends that they've recently been getting a lot of hassle from their credit card companies and one of them. And I, and I don't want to offend this guy, but I have to tell you that it's his fault. We've known for five years that Intuit, which is the, the parent company of QuickBooks is not gun friendly. And if they know you're selling firearms, they will drop you. Well, there are a lot of people saying, well, you know, uh, they haven't dropped me yet. I'll just keep working until they do. And, and then when they do, they, they run around like a chicken with their head cut off trying to, to fix things like they didn't know it was going to happen at some point. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm no longer in the credit card business. You know, people are, are pretty complacent. You know, they say, ah, you know, I've got a real good relationship with my credit card guy. I said, oh, you do? What's his name? Uh, uh, well, you know, <laughs> and they couldn't even tell me his name, but that represented a good relationship. But what it really is, it's too much trouble. I don't want to go through the hassle. I don't want to have to change my account. I don't want to have to go through everything. And if people were honest, they, that's what they would have been telling me. 
So it made it real difficult for me to get excited about trying to start a movement in this country with firearms manufacturers to a, a credit card processing system that was actually friendly to firearms manufacturers. Uh, so I just thought, well, you know, if, if people aren't willing to do a little bit of work and, and get on board for the common good, then it's not worth my time to, to waste it. So it didn't last long. But today, it's not that the government is coercing them not to do business with it. They've all of a sudden become our moral conscience. Banks, credit card processors, anybody who's in a position of being able to say, well, if you want my services, you're going to have to start thinking like I do. And when it comes to firearms after the recent shootings, um, you know, they, they want to do away with anything that has anything to do with firearms. Um, I know that there are people, uh, I watch CNBC. So if you've ever watched CNBC, you probably are in the morning squawk box comes on early. Uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin, who also writes for the Washington Post or the New York Times. Yeah, New York Times. Um, he's a liberal and he doesn't make any bones about that. But his his intention is to go to Visa and MasterCard and all the credit card companies and convince them that it's their social right not to accept firearms transactions. Um, and he's not sure whether that means all of them or just some of them or, but you know, there is no part. There's no way that they can say to a, a, a gun store, we will accept all of your firearms transactions, except those of bump stocks, AR 15s and high capacity magazines. Uh, it just, that it wouldn't work. So instead of doing that, they're just saying, well, we just, we just won't do firearms transactions at all. And I think that's sad because as everybody who has any smarts at all knows that it's, it's not the guns killing these people. It's not the, the high capacity magazines. It's, it's the individual that had them in the first place. Uh, and had we been more diligent about keeping guns out of the hands of the people who shouldn't have them, we probably wouldn't have a lot of these issues. And then that gets back to the point of psychotropic drugs. That's the one thing that every one of these mass murders that we've had in the last few years have in common. They were all on some sort of psychotropic drug because they've been prescribed as being depressed or anti-anxiety or whatever it was. And uh, these drugs, if, if you can't pinpoint it and say that's the cause of this, if they're treating a situation which is the cause of this by prescribing drugs, let's take a look at everyone that's, you know, been prescribed psychotropic drugs and determine whether or not they have these tendencies uh, to, to do crazy stuff like this. And, and, and I don't have a solution for this. I really don't. I think as long as there's humans out there and as long as humans are human, uh, we're going to have crazy stuff going on. And, uh, and, you know, I'm in the firearms industry and, and you know, I, I can fortunately say none of the firearms that we've ever been associated with have ever been used in a crime. Now, well, that's not really true. A, a guy in, in Florida stole a, fi a 50 cal, one of uh, a McMillan 50 cal and took it across the state line. So that was a federal crime. So, so then it, it was actually used in a crime. But, you know, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, we're just trying to kind of spitball and trying to feel our way around this whole thing like everybody is. Nobody wants our kids to be murdered. Nobody wants to wake up and, and see the news reports about another person, you know, taking countless lives just because he wanted to be famous. Um, I think the one of the best things that we could do is if we convince the media not to put his name and face all over the, the media for three or four weeks. And, you know, if somebody does this, refer to him as, you know, the perpetrator. Don't say his name every five minutes because that's what he's after in the first place. He just wants to be remembered for something. And unfortunately, he's picked a really poor way to be remembered but that's that's what the point is so if we don't help them achieve that goal i think it'll be better uh less people will say well you know i'm gonna go kill a bunch of people nobody will ever know who i am but i'm gonna go do it anyway that's you know it doesn't make sense 
What do you think, Zeph? Honestly, this whole thing boggles me. Um, I think that, it, you know, you take a look at the no-fly rule where they wanted to actually stop anybody who was on the no-fly list, which was, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000 people from buying a gun, where they were not adjudicated or have any other reason other than somebody decided in some federal agency to stop them from going on a plane. And it was incumbent upon them to come up with the money to fight back for their innocence. But here we have situations where we have folks who are known to be uh, uh, having a problem that requires some kind of drug. And, you know, you mentioned depression, but there's so many cases of ADD or ADHD where more parent involvement would be able to, uh, you know, actually I'm getting a request to see my face here. So nostrils and everything, I'm going to go back on video. But I mean, if we were able to actually have folks um, uh, who have ADD or ADHD issues not being prescribed the Ritalin and the Adderall right away, but get the parents involved, go to, you know, psych therapy groups, whatever else can be done other than chemicals, I think we'd see a dramatic reduction. And so much so that if they do need the chemicals, then they might be subject to not buying a gun. Well, that makes sense. And I think that's a place to start. Um, You know, we've actually killed about uh, 10 minutes already. So I think it's time for us to get into the show for about the next 15 minutes. You're going to see a video that we put together earlier in the week. Um, If anybody has been listening to the show for the last six or eight months, you probably heard the uh, segment where Billy Boots, my friend Bill Buckman, uh, came on the show and talked about his hunting and, and he's a cowboy action shooter. Well, this week, end of range is going on out at Ben Avery. And we happened to be out there uh, yesterday and took some videos and we had him in the studio. So I, I want to go ahead and it's going on out at Ben Avery. And we so have to end by, we'll get this video uh, yesterday and took some videos and we had him in the studio. Oh, so I, I want to go ahead and right. going on out at Ben Avery. We're going to go We have to end by, we'll get this video yesterday and took some videos and we had him in the studio. So I want to go ahead and going on out at Ben Avery. And we have to end by, we'll get this video yesterday and took some videos and we had him in the studio. So I want to go ahead and going on out at Ben Avery. We have to end by. This video. Yes, it took some videos and we had him in the studio. So I, I want to go ahead and going on out at here. Everyone welcome to the show. Yes, it took some videos and we had him in the studio. So I want to go All right, we're stopping to share. I guess what happened is, yep, I'm getting everybody in the chat. It is going to stop in a moment. Well, once again, we've we've uh, demonstrated that technology has kicked our butt because we tried this two or three times before the show and it worked perfectly. And maybe because we're broadcasting live. I'm sure that's it because I have to have the uh, uh, speaker on in order for it to work. We're hearing the speaker from the live Facebook, which I'm logged on as. So what I'd like to do is perhaps invite our next ge- our guest on while I log on on another laptop so that we can show the video from the laptop that's not doing the live Facebook. Would that work? Sure. All right. So we're going to have to be nimble, guys, at Voice America. Um, we're probably going to run a little long into a commercial, but I'll let you know when we want to do that. But right now, I want to make sure that David Gabori is out there and ready to go. David, you with us? And David should be coming on right about now. David, unmute yourself. There we go. How are you, man? Good. Thank you. I'm here now. Hey, we uh, we started a little early because we had some technical difficulties with the video we were going to show. But uh, I want to get uh, all of our viewers and listeners acquainted with who you are, what you do. Um, David Gabori, um, what's the name of your company? Bullet Central in okay. Barley, North Dakota. Good deal. And just give us a real brief overview of what Bullet Central does. Bullet Central provides components for building and shooting competition rifles. We don't sell complete guns, but we sell actions, triggers, barrels, uh, some select uh, reloading and cleaning equipment that are kind of specialty items that a competition shooter would be looking for. 
That's great. You know, there's a big demand. Uh, you know, competition shooting is one of the ways that we Americans, you know, express our Second Amendment rights and and choose to use firearms that don't kill anybody. And you know, if you were listening earlier, we were talking about the the situation with the uh, shooter in the school and um, what what people don't really realize is how many Americans shoot. I mean, how big an industry it really is. And it, all you have to do is go to the SHOT Show and spend a couple of days walking around there to see only half of the, of the booths that are set up. Uh, you can't see them all in two days, that's for sure. Uh, to realize that it's a really big business. It really is. And uh, we specialize in, in rifle shooting, but kind of across the board, pistol shooters, rifle shooters, shotgun shooters, uh, competitive shooters uh, are, are really excited about their sports. Uh, they, um, they, they're they really pushing the boundaries of, of the equipment and their, their sport, always looking for new products. Um, uh, online uh, forums help them exchange information and really move the whole sport ahead. So it's really exciting for everybody. You know, a few years back, I was running the rifle company and I wasn't spending nearly as much time with the stock company as I, I do now and as I did before. And that meant I stepped away from being involved in competitions and in supporting the different kinds of competition shooting. And when I basically in, in 2007 or eight, when I left attending matches all the time and kind of got lost from the competition, there was really just a couple of triggers. And Jewel was probably the number one trigger in competition across the board there were some others on shoots made one you know but but jewel was the name all of a sudden i come back and now i'm starting to pay attention and i don't know anybody who's not shooting a bix and andy w what happened yeah it's been a, a pretty amazing transition the last uh, five years or so with the competition shooters and let me tell you how uh, the bix and andy trigger came to be and really that uh, ties in closely with how bullet central came to be uh, Chris Harris, the owner here, is a short-range bench rush shooter, and uh, he shoots on the U.S. team, uh, has for many years. And back in uh, 2011, the world shoot was in France. So Chris and the U.S. team went to France to shoot in, in the world bench rush shoot. And uh, it's a week-long event, including some practice days and competition days. And um, one of the shooters from Austria had a problem with his jewel trigger. And uh, Chris helped him get that going so he could continue with the, the competition. Later in the week, uh, Andy Atzel, one of the other shooters from the uh, team from Austria, came over and showed Chris his rifle and said, uh, hey, Chris, take a look at this trigger I've got in this rifle. This is something I've designed. And uh, Chris, Chris tried that trigger and immediately said, wow, this is, this is different. This is, this is something really special. So they went on with the, uh, the, the match that week, but um, later uh, after the match, Chris followed up with Andy. Uh, they got a couple of sample triggers in the U.S. so that Chris could evaluate them. Uh, they, they talked about a few minor changes to the trigger, and Andy went back and put the, the trigger into production. Uh, Chris, Chris went back and did what he needed to do to, to get an import license to bring these in and formally create Bullet Central uh, to... to, to uh, provide competition gear to shooters. And uh, in early 2013, we started importing the Bix and Andy triggers from, from Austria, uh, originally in the competition configurations. And then uh, last year at uh, 2017 SHOT Show, we introduced the tax sport models that are more geared towards hunting and tactical shooters. So it's really a broad line that offers uh, similar technology for different types of competitive shooters. Well, I, I know what's involved in making a trigger. As a matter of fact, when my brother and I started the rifle company back in 1992, we looked at everything that we wanted to do in-house, and triggers was one of the things that we didn't want to do, because for five, 600 rifles a year to set up to make triggers just for our rifles just didn't make any sense. They're pretty sophisticated stuff, and it if you don't really focus and, and it's not what you do, it's hard to do it really well. I'm really excited with Bix and Andy because I love to hear the story about the, the, 
person who has an idea can implement it into a process, bring it to market and, and be a game changer because it is absolutely been a game changer. Uh, I, I haven't asked every single person on the line, but there just aren't very many that aren't shooting a Bix and Andy anymore. And, and that's across all types of competition. Yeah, you're exactly correct that a trigger is a very tricky thing to design. Uh, a, a, pistol des- a pistol designer never wants to design a new magazine, and a rifle designer never wants to design a new trigger. And uh, Andy is a really creative designer. Uh, the, the, the core of the design relies on some stacked ball bearings in the trigger that allows uh, the trigger to reduce the force that's, that's put on the top sear from, from your bolt to very low levels when you get down to the bottom sear that engages the trigger shoe. So that allows you to, um, to have very light pull weights, but yet be safe and very crisp and very consistent. And uh, if you look at the design of the balls, it's, uh, it's very intricate and the angles involved are very precise to help reduce that, that uh, force that results in, in trigger pull weights down to half an ounce that the, the bench rest shooters look for. So when I hear somebody say that a Bix and Andy trigger has balls, it's just not a rhetorical statement. I mean, they really mean it. They really have balls and, and they really function great. <laughs> You know, I, I learned about them from the guys on the U.S. shooting team shooting FTR. Uh, those are the guys I got to be the closest with. And when I was talking with them and, you know, Phil, uh, I mean, Paul Phillips, I, he, I said, I need to get a, a trigger for this um, F-class rifle I'm building. He said, oh, I'll get you one. And so I think he called you and pretty soon one showed up and, and it was the first experience I really had hands on with it. Uh, what a great piece of work. What I'm amazed about though, is Chris was an engineer and a designer. I mean, Andy, Andy and, yeah. and he, but, but was he in business? What, what did he do? How did yeah. he get into business? Yeah. Andy's been in the firearms business for a long time. He actually manufactures and has designed and manufactured his own actions. Uh, he does wood stocks. Uh, he manufactures his own barrels. So he's really uh, a creative and uh, ingenious guy that has worked for a long time in the firearms business. Well, we know that because this industry is made up of a bunch of guys who have a great idea, they buy a lathe and a mill and they go out in their garage and they start making this product. And you can be successful in this industry doing that, making one product in, you know, in a small shop. Um, how did he get from being that kind of one man shop into the size of company. I think he has to be to not only handle all of the competitive triggers, but, but get into the broad market now with, with hunting and and tactical triggers. Well, Andy, uh, uh, Bix and Andy as a company is still relatively small and Andy is at heart. He's a designer and a machinist. That's really what he loves to do. And that's why when, uh, when Bullet Central got involved, that allowed Chris and Bullet Central to, to handle distribution of the triggers broadly. Andy sells the triggers in Europe, and Bullet Central is the worldwide distributor outside of Europe. So that helps Andy stay focused on uh, what he loves to do, which is designing some new features and uh, staying close to his machine work and design work. Um, I, I want to talk about retail now. Uh, And one of the reasons that we're talking about the Bix and Andy trigger at all is because when we decided to set up ELRHQ.com, basically a one-stop shop for for everything related to long-range shooting and extreme long-range shooting, we wanted to have the best products. And then we thought that Bix and Andy was a a viable product for, for the store. And so when we talked to you about it and we were talking, you know, we're really kind of competitors. Um, Bullet Central probably sells a lot of the products or, or similar products to we do. But, but you know, that's the nice thing about this industry. Um, you're, you were happy to set up us with a, an account to be able to handle the Bix and Andy trigger. So our clients, our customers know that we're, we're carrying top of the line stuff. And your, your customers know that too. So we're really com- um, in competition, but 
but we're, we're not competing against each other. We're going to take whatever segment of the market that we can get and, and, and how much of that I get is up to me and how much I market and, and how hard I work at, at getting the customers to, to buy into what we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, that's a little bit different than a lot of customers would. Had somebody else been in that position, they might have said, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not going to let you sell my triggers, you know, because I, I can sell all the ones I can get in my store. Yeah, sure. You're exactly right. And I think that attitude that we have stems from where Bullet Central started and Chris Harris's background with the short range bench rest shooting crowd, where a lot of their products were specialty items made by small manufacturers, sometimes in their basement. And you really had to work hard to find these guys. And what Bullet Central focused on was taking these products that were maybe not well known and bringing them to the public and sharing them with, with a broader market. And we play sort of a dual role. We do sell our products directly, uh, but we also, where possible, uh, like to set up dealer programs for more broad distribution of, of the products. And because we're the uh, importer of the Big Snandy Triggers, we're in a position where we can set up a, a distribution channel and get those products out more broadly by having lots of resellers. And uh, you're right, uh, you know, we sell actions and, and we sell barrels and a lot of guys do. And uh, there's dealers out there, particularly gunsmiths, uh, who sell uh, barrels and actions like we do, but they're in front of the customer recommending triggers along with the bills that they're doing. And it's really valuable to us and the entire industry to have those folks and and, and uh, people like you selling the the Bix and Andy triggers along with the rest of their gear. You know, you you talked a lot about short range bench rest. That's just a, a part of the market that we decided not to try to attract. Uh, we want to focus on something that we can do really well, long range and extreme long range, and that covers high power uh, F class, both open and FTR and PRS and uh, the extreme long range competitions and stuff. So I, I don't think there's anybody out there right now that has focused extremely uh, um, closely on the ELR community. So that, that separates us a little bit. And we're not trying to sell to bench rest shooters because that, you know, I think that that's something that's better done by somebody who wants to focus on that. And you guys do a, a great job on that. But one thing that we, we learned, and my dad was a bench rest shooter and, the thing that I learned about them is that because the bench rest shooters really want the competition to be a competition between shooters and not just uh, an equipment competition, they share all the information that they have. And I'm sure that that's how that Bix and Andy Trigger became a household name after just a couple of years that every, every guy shooting a, a, a bench rest rifle says, Oh, I got a big Sanandi trigger. You ought to try it. And because they want everybody to have the same opportunities as they do. Cause so when they come away with that gold medal or the trophy or win the match or set a new record, people will say, I was a shooter. That wasn't just because he had the only trigger out there that that's like that, you know? Uh, and I, I think that's important that we keep that idea in all of the shooting sports that let's make it as much about the shooter as we can by keeping the equipment race as close as we can. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. And the, the bench rest shooters have been very good about sharing information about uh, what products they're using. Um, and it's a, it's a good idea to keep watch of what all the shooting sports are doing, not just focused on what your particular shooting discipline is doing, because people are learning stuff all over the place. And we're all trying to solve the same problem, right? How do we deliver a bullet accurately to some target? And there's a lot of variables. And, um, you know, the bench rest shooters are, are focused on a lot of problems that, that they've made progress on with their products and skills. Uh, the peer, PRS guys are, are trying to solve a little bit different version of the, the problem, and they've made some progress in, in other areas, and it's great to watch what other disciplines are doing. You can learn a lot, and everybody seems to be really willing to share their information. So how did you get in the uh, firearms industry? Um, like most people, my interest uh, uh, started from my dad's interest in firearms. Uh, he was uh, originally a tool and die maker. And uh, back in the 50s, he was involved in, uh, in bullseye pistol shooting. So he had a little side business doing some gunsmithing. 
And then uh, he, in the 70s, he stepped aside from his career for a while and bought the local gun shop. And uh, I was just the right age to start working there. And uh, I was selling guns before I was old enough to drive. It was, uh, it was a great time in the 70s, a great time for collectors, a lot of uh, really interesting guns on the market back then. And uh, I stepped away from that um, uh, after college. Uh, I had a career in software development for many years and uh, retired from that more recently and uh, was really enjoying retirement until Chris Harris came along. Uh, he had been a friend of mine for a long time and said, hey, Bullet Central is uh, getting busier. We need some more people. Uh, you'd be a great asset to the company. And I said, sure, I'll give it a try. And uh, that's, that's how I ended up here. And so you're having a great time. Having a great time. You know, I get to talk to shooters every day who are trying to build rifles for whatever whatever competitive interests they have. It's great to hear what people are doing. Uh, it's great to see the excitement they all have when they're thinking about what rifle they're going to put together. Let's talk about rifles for a second, because that's kind of a, a, a different animal when you talk about competition rifles and getting customers. Uh, it's almost exclusively a man's name that is recognizable as the guy to go to, to have a custom rifle built. Um, Alex Sittman is known as the best stock guy in the country. If you want to have the very best stock installation done, he doesn't build guns, but if you want to have him do a bedding job and install a stock on your rifle, he's as good as there is. Um, where does bullet central fit into that? Um, mindset of, well, you know, I want John Pierce or, you know, Ryan Pierce or Alex Wheeler or any number of the guys out there that are building top-notch competition guns. How do you compete with that? Do you have one guy that's, that's branding himself as that gun builder? No, we don't do any of the gunsmithing work ourselves. Oh, okay. We're supplying products to okay. gunsmiths and to customers who are looking to do bills. And, and a lot of the people that you mentioned, like Alex Wheeler and Ryan Pierce, are a customer of ours. Uh, they, um, they're buying products or their customers are buying products and going to them. So you see people um, working a lot with local gunsmithing resources that they have, or they're reaching out to some of the more well-known gunsmiths like the ones that you mentioned. Uh, and, and together, either their gunsmith or, or them directly are coming to us looking for products. We supply the products uh, and any in information that we can to help them with their build, but they're relying on those other gunsmith resources to get it done. Uh, yeah, I remember now, as you were talking, you said you don't sell rifles, you just sell components, actions, and barrels and stuff. Uh, one of the things that, that I found really interesting is that, you know, when my dad started building guns, he was in his late thirties after a career in the air force, he retired, but you know, you look at um, Alex Wheeler and Ryan uh, Pierce and some of the younger guys that they're, they have a different mindset about how to do business. Some of the older guys who just kind of got into it because they were a competitive shooter and building guns for themselves and, and their buddy asked them to build one. Then all of a sudden they're this gun bill these young guys know that you've got to make an investment in a business. So they're buying products, they're keeping them on the shelf and they're being able to deliver guns when a normal wait time for a competition gun is anywhere from six to months to a year. They're being able to deliver guns in a reasonable length of time because they've made the investment in the, the components to have them on the shelf and to be able to do it. And that's, I think that's a different mindset than what we've seen in the competition uh, gun building area over the last, you know, 45 years or so. Yeah, I think it is. Um, most of these gunsmiths are, are small shops at best, oftentimes one man shops. So they're torn like any small business between hands-on work and uh, answering the phones or answering emails. I think, um, Media these days makes things a little easier to, to get their word out and to respond to customers. Um, they're looking for quality products that help them cut down their, their cycle time on building rifles. So if, if they can buy an off-the-shelf action that is, is very accurate and ready to go rather than having to buy something that they have to true up uh, before they can even get to the point of, you know, understanding what the customer needs. It saves them a lot of time. It gives the customer better product and, and they can get uh, more people out on the range. 
Yeah, I think you and I uh, have the same view on that. I think it's awesome. Uh, Dave, I really appreciate you being on. Uh, I love the fact that you guys are bringing quality products to the shooting sports. Thanks for allowing uh, ELRHQ to, to carry the Bix and Andy trigger and, uh, you know, helping our, uh, make our job a little bit easier for us of providing really top-notch equipment. Thanks, Kelly. I appreciate the time to be here. Okay. Anything you need from me, you let me know. We'll take care of you. All right. We'll do. I appreciate it. Okay. And uh, for the rest of our listeners and viewers, I would like to uh, ask you to stick around for a couple of minutes while we take a short commercial break. Okay. We're on break, but we're also live at the same time. Okay. So that was... uh... (laughs) Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, hopefully that was what you're looking for. Oh, it was awesome. You did great. Thanks. Really good. And I'm going to demote you to an attendee now. So you yeah. can still be part of the uh, fun, but from the attendee view. And for the rest of us, that was quite an adventure. Um, you know, we had the same problem when we tried to show the video clip of Kevin Finley fishing uh, while we were out at uh, Ben Avery. And we thought, oh, we've got all that solved but we added one more component that we didn't have then. And that was the Facebook live and just didn't, you know, realize it was going to create the same situation. And you know, that's a perfect segue into how your weight loss is going. Kelly. Oh yeah. I tend to bite off more than I can chew as I did with the live (laughs) today, but you know, I did you and Billy Buckman against the green screen the other day and I couldn't help but not notice you probably lost at least 10 pounds since you started. Yeah, I uh, I forgot to mention last week that uh, when I weighed in on Friday morning, I was 245 pounds. Um, and, you know, it seems like it's taken forever, but that was actually 10 pounds below my 255 the day after SHOT Show. So I'm okay with that. And uh, this morning when I weighed, it was 243. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm slowly going down. I think the, it's better for me if I just lose a couple of pounds a week and, you know, don't lose it all at once and then have to worry about it coming right back. So anyway, I do. Yeah. I'm going to be in the gym every day on the beach. You know, I'm going to have to walk around with my gut hanging out exposed. So I want to make sure that it doesn't grow in front of their very eyes. So. Voice America, how much longer until we're back down on your side? Thirty seconds, guys. Okay. Okay, we got about thirty seconds before we come back to uh live broadcast, even though you're seeing us on Facebook. So just hang on. We'll get to you. Now, are we gonna try the video segment? We are. So okay. I'm going to go into share screen right now and I'm going to click on what I need to click on. And we're just going to hold it for those viewers. Um, here we go. Voice America Sports. You are listening to Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan. Now back to the show. Hey, everyone. Thanks for sticking around through the commercial break. Um, uh, Great interview with uh, Dave. And I I just really, really can't say enough about the Bixen Andy trigger. So I was glad to have it on. Now we're going to step away and uh, show this video. Hopefully this time it will be better than the last time it was. So Zev, do your magic. All right. At this point, Kelly, I'll ask you and I to both mute our microphones. Uh, Assassin's National Championship, title winner race here in Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Uh, today, I'm really excited about having Bill, Billy Boots Buckman, a really good friend of mine, on the show. For those of you who have been listening to us for a while, probably remember the episode we did with Billy Boots. Um, I'm happy to have him here today because he's in town for winter range so billy why don't you tell us what winter range is okay winter range is uh, sas single action shooting society's national championship of cowboy action shooting uh the uh national championship here in phoenix world championship uh out near albuquerque but uh we this is a 
pretty full match with uh, 36 stages and around 20 shooters per uh, uh, per stage, three different rotations for three days, so around 800 shooters. Wow, that's, it, you know, it's amazing. I know it's a big deal when you come out here. There's tents with all kinds of products that are associated with cowboy action shooting. I know the women get all dressed up. Of course, here you are in your time period garb. Let's talk about that a little bit because that's one of the cool things about going to a, a cowboy action shooting match. It's really fun to watch because you get to see all all kinds of characters. Exactly. So uh, what's your character? My character to me, uh, I just came up with Billy Boots. It's, I felt like it was just a a young cowhound uh, on the uh, out on the range, uh, on the cattle drives and such, and I've been asked, well, what about the, your, your striped pants? Because I'm kind of known to wear pretty loud, a lot louder than this striped pants, but I, and I say, oh, I think a young cowboy had enough money out on the cattle drive to go buy him a nice pair of pants, and uh, so that's it, and uh, my boots kind of say things for Billy Boots, but uh, it's just kind of, uh, that's kind of me. The hat is, uh, I, I wanted uh, DeBarge Jay to make me a hat that looked like Billy the Kid's hat. And he did a great job, so uh, I give Dave credit for the hat. Looks like the one in all the pictures you see of Billy the Kid. So uh, anyway, that's kind of my trademark. And uh, uh, That's so. part of what they require is period correct clothing and yes. firearms. Yes, pre-1900. We have, uh, you look like pre-1900 in your clothes, in your firearms, or you have one... Uh, one option is to go be western with the Bescadera holsters, the Flaherty shirt, you know, Roy and Jean type thing. And there's uh, and there's certain uh, rules for each category that we have, and there's uh, well over 25 different categories. But uh, classic cowboy uh, pins you down to what particular cartridge you might shoot in a rifle. I shoot black powder, which and I shoot with one hand, which is Frontier cartridge duelist. So I have to shoot black powder or a black powder sub which means smoke so I'm at the disadvantage as far as placement and overall standing because I'm dealing with smoke but firearms are, are period correct pre 1900s that picks up a few pump shotguns like a model 97 it's legal because it was patented it does it doesn't matter that it might have been made in 1955 it's still patented. <laughs> so you've got over your clothing and that's kind of cool stuff but let's talk about your firearms uh, I see you got your pistols on. You have okay. two of them. Okay. So okay. Do, does everybody shoot two pistols? Everyone will shoot two revolvers of some sort. The cap and ball, uh, they have their own category called Frontiersmen. So uh, they'll shoot cap and ball. Most uh, most of us, us, I'll say, will shoot probably 38s. But you could shoot uh, 45, very, very popular, especially in classic cowboy. If you want 38 40s, you can shoot them, or 44 40. But as long as they're period correct and they're single action, this gun is not old at all. Uh, uh, patented uh, really by Freedom Arms in, in uh, 1997, but it's a clone of what a Colt looked like in in the correct period. I noticed you corrected me when I said pistol, and because it's a revolver, and I know pistols are modern day semi-automatics. Yeah. But you know, I, handgun, pistol, That's right. uh, you know, yeah. most of us, we call them whatever. That's so, right. But these are revolvers, mm -hmm. and they're based on the old Colt. Based on the Colt design. Now, your, your competition is different than some, where you have to shoot with both hands. I shoot a duelist. Uh, a duelist will shoot with one hand, or they'll trade off one to the other. But, mm -hmm. he, but he actually fires with one hand. I shoot double duelist, which means pretty much ambidextrous. I will draw the right hand and shoot, draw the left hand and shoot, then I get the advantage of holstering. I can be shooting left hand while I'm reaching for a shotgun or reaching for shotgun shells, reaching for lever action gun, whatever. That, that's a little bit of an advantage. Disadvantage is we're not quite as fast as the guys shooting with two hands. <laughs> but you know, you have your choice. There's what, eight or so different types of competitions that you can get into in cowboy action shooting? Yes, there uh, and there's a lot of age based. Okay. Because so many of the shooters that came in over in uh, from other disciplines now we're getting on in the years and elder statesmen uh, say, uh, you know, seventy year old people are one of the biggest categories there are out there. And even cattle baron 
at 75 and above is a big class because wow. that's that, that's the people that do a lot of traveling and so they can make these matches and there's some guys like you who are, who even though they're up there in age you're still darn competitive i mean the young guys yes. got to really watch it or you'll beat them well in my particular class frontier cartridge duelist uh, some matches will divide it in a little bit age but out here at winter range national championship I'm up against anybody. He can be 30 years old, and here I am, 72, and it's a wide open age class, which makes it kind of difficult. I don't get from A to B as fast as some of those guys that's 30. Yeah, but you're smooth. I'm smooth, <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and, and I still do okay. Yeah. Now I want to introduce Charlotte Buckman, Sassy Boots, and she actually is a competitor as well. Uh, her and uh, Bill got married a, a few years ago and since then she's been attending and she decided recently that she wanted to start shooting and I hear you got some of the top of the line guns for Christmas. I did. Yeah. <laughs> well, can you tell us a little bit about what you got so we can uh, know what to look for when you're out there? Uh, best I can. Yeah. I have <laughs> a Jimmy set of Rugers to uh -huh. Jimmy Spar guns. Wow. That's I a big I, name. And I believe that Bill honestly thought I would go to the other gun that I had. Uh -huh. but it didn't happen that way. Uh, he, he was hoping you picked the cheaper one, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you've got two, two guns here. Why don't you hand those to Billy so we can talk about it. Let's go with the shotgun first. Okay. This uh, shotguns, that we've got uh, guys that really soup up. We shoot. They look like a typical double barrel shotgun with a short barrel, but they're all souped up on the inside. We can chamfer the chamber. So shells, uh, these are dummies, go in real fast. It's all about how fast you do things, but, uh, but honing the insides, maybe taking chokes out of the barrel. But uh, people like uh, Goat Neck Clem, Johnny Meadows, Boomstick J, do all this slicking up for these guns uh, to make them very competitive and as fast as you can shoot them. And we may have, uh, usually have knockdowns with the shotguns, but often we'll have a bird or something. So anyway, they're, uh, they're souped up pretty good. But this is, this is period correct mm -hmm. because the action is of the double barrel shotguns uh, in the in pre-1900. Well, I know for a fact in pistol, you, you load specific loads. Yes. It, it's got to be enough to knock down uh, the targets. Yes. So you really are critical about how much powder and, and how powerful the load is because you want to knock down the targets, but you don't want any more recoil than you absolutely have to deal with. Exactly. Exactly. So that, now, my criteria in a, in a black powder class is not um, velocity or knockdown or power factor. We have to make X amount of smoke and we have a standard of smoke. <laughs> But in the other classes, it's uh, we have a little power factor. It's pretty simple. It's uh, you know if you drive a hundred grain bullet at six hundred, you've made the power factor. But sometimes, and we'll have it at this match, we'll have knockdown targets with pistol and rifle. So you don't want any just little little funky load to get out there and just go pop. But again, especially as duelists, the less recoil I have to go from target to target, I don't want to be shooting a full house load of a forty-five and be competitive. No. Cool. We've covered the shotgun, so let's talk about the rifle. Charlotte, why don't you uh, yes. hand Bill the rifle? And uh, thanks for b being on the show with us and helping us out. You can go sit down and right, you, you know watch your husband do his thing. All right. <laughs> All, right. All right. The rifle is a, a replica of a uh, Winchester 73, and uh, but it's had a lot of race stuff done to it, and uh, got jewelling on it, and uh, nice padded leather wrap, uh, barrels. Uh, uh, only 20 inches compared to a lot of the older guns. Uh, Carrier is lighter. This particular gun was Cowboys and Indians guns, but uh, there's a lot of great gunsmiths out there. Cody Conninger, uh, Boomstick J. Uh, we have a lot of their products. This particular one is just a Jim Bowie job, and it's uh, very slick, very short stroke. Take that away from the old guns that were way out here. Very fast, very speedy, still 38 in a 357 chamber. and. Uh, you know, we all know that the price of guns has to do with the demand, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of cowboy action shooters, and so these guns aren't cheap. No. Uh, they're, they're really fine workmanship, there's no, mm -hmm. no question about the quality, but 
some would think they see a lever action gun and, and they remember those kids the BB guns and the replicas and the 22s and they're thinking like 300 bucks and that's probably not going to get you an appointment with one of these guys to build one no, of these guns. No, no. Uh, yeah, the gun itself, uh, you can uh, get uh, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars in uh, in a nice lever gun, but then you're going to put them another five or six hundred dollars, probably, in to make them really race ready if you want to be a real competitor. Okay, tomorrow you have practice, right? A practice warm round, yes, warm, warm up, up okay. or if I want to go shoot fast. Fastest pistol, fastest shotgun. Just and they have just, side matches. They have side mm -hmm. matches, uh, and then they have what called frontiersman match for guys that shoot the captain ball and uh, uh, and some of that stuff. But tomorrow we'll have warm ups, uh, different rotations of warm ups. Shoot four or five stages to just kind of get you ready. What what it's really going to kind of feel like come Thursday morning, seven o'clock. So Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, yes. full day of competition. Full day. If anybody happened to be from Phoenix and they wanted to drive out to Ben Avery. They yes. could find the, the match. It, you can't miss it. As a matter of fact, you have to park down the ways and they haul you in on a trailer. And, That's right. Um, there'll be literally several hundred people there just watching. That's right. And uh, lunch is there. They have all kinds of stuff. So anyone who's in Phoenix that really wants to watch this, um, you know, this is going to probably be aired on Friday. So if you get out Friday afternoon or Saturday, you'll be able to see what Cowboy Action Shooting is all about. Yes, mostly Friday and Saturday is uh, is a general public day. There's lots of vendors. People can come out and buy things uh, that they want to take home or give the grandkids or whatever. But a lot of vendors and a lot of shopping to be done, a lot of good food to have, and, and a lot of great shooters to watch shoot. Well, Billy, I really appreciate you coming in, spending some time with us. Good luck this weekend. Well, thank you. Um, let's end by letting our listeners know just how good you really are. I know you don't like to talk about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, give us some of your accomplishments. So if they came out specifically to watch you, what they could expect. Well, I don't know if we can still expect it or not. But uh, anyway, I have been the national champion six times. Uh, and a world champion five times and uh, took a second or third place many 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 times along the road in the last uh, 15 to 20 years but uh, and then that's in the big matches and there's, we have regional matches that have attended and done well and state matches and, and such as that but, uh, well good i want to take just a few minutes one last thing for those of you who have been regulars on with us on our show you, you probably recognize the name todd hodnett and, you know, the funny thing is, is I met Todd and, you know, kind of through Billy in, a, in a, a way he told me about Todd, this guy who who had just, you know, was a, a cowboy action shooter and was really getting into long range shooting. And this was many years ago. And since I've gotten to know Todd a lot better, tell us the story about, how, you know, how you know Todd and, and what he's become to you. Well, Todd, uh, Todd's family uh, ran a ranch not far from me. And uh, uh, Todd had kind of excelled in most everything he had done from archery to skydiving and golf or whatever and he took up cowboy action shooting so we we would train together and, and uh, he would he would, I'd go to his house or he'd come to my range and uh, his uh, alias was handlebar doc and so that's what most people knew him by and my wife and I then called him our, our son as well as uh, his running buddy long hunter but uh, anyway uh, Todd got a sliding off and I was one time I was at a at a big match and he calls and say hey I've been down here in South Texas training these guys and they want me to shoot long range and I kind of like it and will you get me some ammo from Black Hills don't you know them and I said yeah well in just a few months he's a national champion long range shooter and he picked up the military saw him and the rest of it's really history. Well that's really cool and you know we like to make all these connections from the people that that we know throughout the industry and and you and Todd, you, you know, you're a pair, both of you, some of the nicest people I've ever met. Uh, Billy, thanks again for being with us. Uh, good luck this weekend and, and hope you tear them up. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I enjoyed being here. Thank good you. Deal. Okay, that went pretty well. I really enjoyed watching that. It's the first time I really sat through and watched it. It was really a lot of fun. And that leaves us with about one minute for Cooper. Cooper, do you have time to, to get on here and tell us, uh, tell everybody what's going on? Because we've got social media going on. <laughs> yes. Uh, so please follow and like Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Taking Stock with Kelly McMillan. And then for everything McMillan, please follow McMillan Fiberglass Stocks on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 
and we're going to do our best to get a St. Patrick's Day sale out. So be sure to sign up for our emails. Uh, you can do that by going to Macmillan Fiber or MacmillanUSA.com and signing up for our newsletter there. Awesome, Cooper. Thanks. I know you're a little under the weather. I appreciate you sitting through yeah. that and uh, uh, providing that for us. And I want to thank everybody else that's out there watching us. To, I'm so excited. I, you know, I'm haven't been able to look at Facebook and I'm really excited to see what kind of response we got from the people that were watching. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you all back here next week. Thanks for joining us. All clear. Okay. We're still live on Facebook until I leave meeting. So Kelly, uh, say goodbye to our Facebook folks. Goodbye everybody. Thanks for <laughs> hanging out with us. It's been a lot of fun. Take care until next week. Bye.